There's a bit of a loophole in the NFL concussion protocol that helps to explain how we got from this on Sunday with Tua to what we unfortunately witnessed Thursday night. Welcome back everybody, I'm Dr. Brian Suter, and if you're new here and enjoy learning about the medical side of sports, then please consider subscribing to stay up to date with future videos. In this video, we're gonna talk about the one tiny part of the NFL concussion protocol that is extremely important in understanding how we got to this point. Plus, I wanna answer a bunch of questions, like should Tua retire? When is it safe for him to return? Should he have flown home with the team? And what I think needs to change going forward about the protocols. There are various signs of a concussion. One of them is the abnormal posturing or rigid limb position that we saw in Tua Thursday night. Interestingly, this is eerily familiar to what Tua looked to do with his hands after the hit on Sunday. You can see his hands have some of that rigidity here and how similar that looks to what we actually saw Thursday night. And while we're on it, the fencing response versus posturing. Fencing is really just a more specific type of posturing, classically like we saw with job at best where one of the arms or both arms are in more of an extended position. And then there's decorticate and decerebrate posturing, which are just two other types. Just understand when you see the limbs in any fixed abnormal position after a head trauma, that that's an outward sign of that brain trauma. What we saw with Tua was really more of just general posturing in my opinion, but it really is kind of an academic point. If you see something like this, just know that it's severe. Now back to the rest of our no-goes. Another one is gross motor instability or balance difficulties like we saw Tua display after he hit his head on Sunday against the Bills. Daniel Jones's was another example of this potential for gross motor instability. Impact seizure like we saw with Tom Savage or like we saw last year when Donald Parham's hands were shaking after his injury. And one of the first steps in the concussion protocol is to look for these no-go signs, these outward displays of an internal brain trauma. Confusion and amnesia, meaning memory loss, are also two things that are considered no-go, so it doesn't matter what happens with the rest of the testing. All of these different SCAT-5 protocols, these exam questions, the neurologic exam, none of those things matter if you see these no-go signs. And that's a really important point, because somebody could be observed to have an impact seizure on the field, but then by the time they maybe get to the locker room, they frankly could test completely normal. It would be extremely unusual, but it's not impossible. But that doesn't matter because they had a no-go sign, which was that impact seizure. They're out for the rest of the game. They're in the concussion protocol. Now, this small little loophole that can make a huge difference comes into play with this gross motor instability. We'll address what it is and how it can be fixed, but first I wanna give a quick shout out to the sponsor of this video. Today's video is sponsored by Raycon, the maker of what's been my go-to earbud for the past year, the Everyday Earbud. Raycon's Everyday Earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever. Ever since they sent me these about a year ago, I've honestly been using them for every time I need earbuds, particularly when I'm exercising or working out in the yard. They offer eight hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life in this case, which is also super slick because it can wirelessly charge. They're perfect for my runs because they have these optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit that doesn't budge at all during those rigorous activities. They're also really low profile, which is perfect for all those online meetings. If you hold the button on the left earbud for three seconds, you can access one of three different sound profiles. And holding the right button for three seconds will access either noise isolation or sound awareness mode. Click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash brianmd to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. I've put these things through a ton over the past year and I've always come back to them as the most reliable and just best sounding earbuds that I've used. So click the link below to get 15% off your Raycon purchase and thank you again to Raycon for sponsoring this video. Now loophole sounds like somebody is intentionally being deceitful and I don't think there's deceitful intent here. I think it's just poorly worded and leaves a lot of room for ambiguity that unfortunately leads to the potential for these types of situations. This is some marketing material on the NFL's website. It's basically their concussion day checklist and if you kind of go down and really like zoom in to the fine print here, it says that this gross motor instability in order to be a no-go has to be determined by the team physician in consultation with the independent neuro consultant to be neurologically caused. Then if you go look at the big formal like full PDF document about the complete protocol, it's worded a little bit differently. It says that they have to be able to rule out an orthopedic cause of observed instability. It may sound nitpicky, but to me, these sort of imply two different things. In one case, they're saying, well, you have to prove that it's a neurologic cause. And in the other, they're saying you have to rule out something else, which honestly in medicine sort of means two different ways of approaching the problem. Either way, what it does is introduces some unfortunate subjectivity where the team might say, well, in our opinion, we feel like it's orthopedic. It might be really hard to prove that it was neurologic just based on your exam. Because honestly, like I said, your exam might have normalized by the time you get back to the locker room. Also with just your standard physical exam and with an x-ray, 
it's really hard to rule out an orthopedic thing. I think the intent when they wrote this was to cover situations like broken legs, dislocated knees, times where it was obvious that an orthopedic cause was the reason for somebody's instability. When you introduce this type of language, you rely on that subjectivity of the evaluator, which is really hard to necessarily prove one way wrong or the other. It's part of why I don't think this investigation is really going to show that somebody necessarily did something against the protocol. The bigger question is why somebody felt this was orthopedic as opposed to neurologic given the circumstances, not whether or not they follow the specific protocol. The protocol allows for this subjectivity. It's just very questionable subjectivity. My guess is this changes to where it has to be either clear and obvious orthopedic trauma, like a knee dislocation, but if it's not clear and obvious, you have to assume that it's neurologic, not you have to prove it's neurologic, but that you have to assume it's neurologic, especially when you've seen it happen right after an impact to the head. These protocols changed after the Tom Savage hit and there's no reason they can't continue to improve. Let's wrap up by addressing some final questions here that I've seen on social media. First of all, should Tua retire? No, I don't think this is any evidence that Tua should retire. A lot of people will think of cases like Austin Colley, right? A player who had multiple concussions and ultimately did retire because of repeated head injuries. Having these two back to back is certainly concerning to see, but doesn't necessarily make me think that it should be cause for retirement. It might be cause for down the road if additional concussions occur, you have a lower threshold to talk about retirement for Tua's safety, but just these two together, I don't think there's anything inherently bad about what could have happened that would make me say he should retire. Next, when will Tua return? Now, this is gonna sound crazy to a lot of people, but the protocol would allow Tua to return next week for week five. It's a five-step return to play process with one step taking place each day. So theoretically, Tua has plenty of time where if his symptoms all resolve and his testing is normal, he could return to play. Would I recommend it? Probably not. But that's also going off of the assumption from me that the first impact was also a concussion. If the team still thinks what we saw Thursday was his first concussion, then it wouldn't surprise me at all to see him back in just over 10 days. Next, the whole flying home with the team and being discharged from the hospital. A lot of people were concerned here, of course, about second impact syndrome, which while extremely, extremely rare, can be deadly. It occurs when you suffer a second concussion before you're healed from the first one. Usually, if second impact syndrome is going to occur, it happens pretty quickly. It's thought that there's some dysregulation of blood flow within the brain that causes pressure to build up and basically causes the tissue of your brain to be pushed around in abnormal ways and do something we call herniate. This usually happens within like minutes to hours, not like days later. So technically after a period of being watched in the hospital and having normal scans, I think there is a good level to feel safe that it was okay for him to leave the hospital. I don't think it's negligent that he would have flown back home. Remember, this is a totally different team of doctors at the hospital who know the history that are saying it's okay for you to go. And one final point with this that was equally frustrating, just observing everything take place. Whenever we saw this happen on Sunday, there was some initial outrage, but it felt like it kind of just got shrugged off and people just said, well, the team said it's his back, so boy, it looked like a head injury, but they said it's his back, so okay. Now Thursday and in the subsequent days, it's been like everybody is suddenly on the other side of the spectrum, just outraged over what happened on Sunday. I think the media has a responsibility in these situations to call things like we see it, to push harder, to ask these harder questions. There's nothing about the fact that he was hit on Thursday that in and of itself really warrants that level of a response. That level of response was warranted after Sunday. It's just that now it looks worse, the optics are worse, and so that level of response comes out. But people should have been bringing that energy on Sunday, and that's what I hope happens in the future if we see something like this take place again. That's it for the end of this video. I likely won't do any more on this topic until we see like results of the investigation or get some major updates, but I wanted to kind of put some finishing touches on my thoughts with it and just address some of those questions. Let me know as always any other questions or comments down below. And until next time, we'll see you later.